Hello, everybody that's uh, joining the AVCC annual meeting and our virtual summit. Uh, we're going to wait till everybody comes in and give a few minutes for everybody to join. But what would be good, if you don't mind, is in the chat, maybe put your name and what conservation commission you're from. So we have an idea of who's here and uh, what, what CCs or what towns are being covered. And I'll go ahead and start the meeting probably in about two or three minutes. Think one more minute and we'll get started. Greta, will you let me know when the waiting room is empty? Yes, the waiting room is empty and it's it's turned off. So folks should be able to just join as they want to now. Okay, great. Good. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Again, thank you all for joining us today for the 2023 Association of Vermont Conservation Commission's virtual summit and our annual meeting. Um, before I get started, I wanna just talk about the format for the meeting. And I know everybody has been on lots and lots of Zoom calls uh, and kind of knows the, the way to conduct ourselves on Zoom calls, but if you could mute yourself um, so that we don't get any background noises. Uh, keep your picture on, it's nice to see lots of faces. Um, since we can't all be in, a, in the same room. And then what we're going to ask is um, um, hold your questions, either type them into the chat or hold them till after we have our presentations. We were very fortunate to have a lot of conservation commissions that were willing to present uh, how they use their tiny grant funds. So we're going to really be pushing our hour limit and we may go over an hour and I'm Sorry for those of you who need to get off right at one, uh, but we're gonna do our best to stay on track and allow some time for questions and answers at the end. What we're gonna do is I will uh, start the meeting out. I'll hold the AVCC annual meeting. Uh, when that's done, I'll turn it over to Bill, who's our um, who is our treasurer, but we'll also be talking about uh, the 30 by 30 legislation. Um, and then Marion will be introducing um, each of the conservation commissions and the speakers and Caitlin will be uh, controlling the slides so that we have everything in a, in a standard format. So that's how we're gonna do the format for the meeting. Um, again, thank you for joining us. We decided to forego our annual in-person summit this year because next year there's gonna be a really big conservation summit across the state, a statewide one, and we will be participating in that. And we decided that's where we put it, would put a lot of our energy and resources to get ready for that. It'll be hosted in the spring of next year, and I just encourage everybody to watch for more information as it comes out through our listserv about this statewide conservation summit. It's going to have a lot of other organizations involved. It should be 
It should be very informative and fun. Uh, to, today, we've, we've come together to highlight some of the Conservation Commission projects or, from around the state. Um, these Conservation Commissions, they all received tiny grant uh, awards um, over the last several years that helped them fund these projects. They're going to share a bit about their projects, the successes, the challenges, and lessons they learned along the way. As I said, there will be time for Q&A at the very end of all the presentations. And Bill is going to give us an overview of the recently passed uh, 30 by 30 legislation here in Vermont. And the idea is that hopefully it will prime some thoughts on all your all's parts about how conservation commissions can get engaged in the 30 by 30 work as it becomes more apparent uh, as it works its way through the legislative process, etc. cetera. Um, let me pull up my slides real quick and share the screen. Caitlin, is that, are those, of, can you see those? Yep, we can see them. Okay. Okay, great. Um, we have two very generous sponsors who um, who uh, provided us with funds to help fund tiny grants in the future. In the past, um, we got many more sponsors when we held in-person um, uh, summits. In this year, Vermont Family Forests and VNRC both stepped up and, and provided some very nice sponsorships, and those monies will be used to help pay for future tiny grants. Sponsorships are a very important source of funding for tiny grants, and tiny grants help uh, a lot of conservation commissions across the state. So with that, I'd like to call our ABCC annual meeting to order. Um, and just remind everybody, the Association of Vermont Conservation Commission, we are a nonprofit organization whose mission is to support Vermont's conservation commissions across the state and to encourage the establishment of more conservation commissions in the state. If there are any towns that are on this meeting that don't have conservation commissions and would like more information about how to form one or would like support or help in forming one, please reach out to us through our uh, email uh, that's on our website. Uh, AVCC is a membership organization uh, with conservation commissions as well as individuals that are our members. And those memberships also go to fund tiny grants uh, every year. AVCC was founded in 1990 and it's overseen by a volunteer board of directors. We have no paid staff. I've got up on the screen here, the AVCC board that I just wanna recognize real quick. Bill Del, Del Asola is our treasurer. Uh, Caitlin Drasher, Greta are on the board. Nancy Jones is our secretary. Justin Marsh, Suma, and Marion are on the board, and I'm the chair for the AVCC. And speaking of Nancy Jones, Nancy is one board member who was up to who was uh, up for renewal for her seat this year, and she's decided to step off this year at the end of her term. Nancy's served on the AVCC board for over 20 years. Uh, it's probably more than that. I reached out to Nancy to ask her how long she's been on the board and she wasn't really sure, but she knows it was at least 20 years. So she's been a member of the AVCC for a long time. She also is the chair of the Bradford Conservation Commission and she's co-chair on Bradford's Conservation Fund Committee, which she also helped found. She's been a very active member of the AVCC board and she's filled the role of secretary for as many years as I can remember uh, being on the board. She's been with the AVCC through a lot of changes in this organization. And because she's been around so long, she's provided what I'll call the corporate memory for all of us that are relatively new to the board. Nancy's very dedicated to conservation and she's an individual. She shows it with her action as well as her words. Uh, we're sorry that Nancy's decided to step down. We'll miss her, but we wish her well and, and wish her all the best in all of her future endeavors. So, Nancy, thank you very much for serving on the board. And I'd like to just, if we could take a second and give a round of applause for Nancy and all of the other board members. Thank you for your time. Greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mark.
I'm actually on here as Bill because I couldn't log on on my own. So I, Bill sent me the link and I logged on as Bill. So we've got two Bills up on the screen. Thank you so much. Well, Nancy, thank you for, for your time. We we really appreciate your time and all your effort and your energy and, and being with us. And we will miss you. It has been a real pleasure and I will miss all of you. But I'm sure it's in, in very good hands. So the AVCC board, it's made up of nine individuals. Five are appointed by VNRC and four are volunteer members. Nancy was a volunteer member. I'm a volunteer member. Um, Suma is a volunteer member. Um, we meet monthly for one to one and a half hours via Zoom to conduct our business. Uh, we have one in-person retreat every year so that we can get together and, and talk and share ideas and plan for the next year. Um, it's a fun organization. It's a fun group of people to work with. At this time, we have an open seat on the board for a volunteer member. You heard Nancy talk about how much she's enjoyed it and how long she was on. So Nancy, thank you for that. Um, if anyone on this is interested in becoming a board member, feel free to reach out to me by sending an email to me at the Vermont Conservation at gmail.com, which is the email for the AVCC. Um, and I will get back to you and answer any questions, but we're, we're always looking for board members who would like to be engaged. Uh, at this time, this year, we have no board seats up for renewal, so we will not be making any motions or voting to uh, for any board members. Last thing I'd like to do before I turn it over to Bill is review our finances. Um, the AVCC assets right now, they total just over 5,500 uh, in 2023 prior to, a, well, I say right now, it was $5,500 prior to awarding over $2,000 in tiny grants to four grantees. So far to date, we have over $3,300 in the bank. We're working to recapitalize to support more tiny grants in 2024 through membership dues and sponsorships. I mentioned earlier how important sponsorships are, so we're really gonna be working to get more sponsors for next year. Um, we're looking to reduce our overhead costs, which are not very much. Uh, the main thing of our overhead costs is our ma maintaining our website and our Zoom account. Uh, membership income is slightly down this year. Um, so if your Conservation Commission did not renew their membership, please do so. Those memberships are small, but they're very important to us. Um, overall, AVCC has operated in a tight margin in 2023. We have every year since I've been on, and we will continue to do so. We thank the towns and the individual members for providing your annual dues, and we ask that you continue to do so because it is very important to our programs. Uh, as I said earlier, we will have a 2024 in-person meeting as part of the, the statewide conservation conference next year that is evidently going to be in June. I guess that's a, that date has been uh, decided, and it'll be at the Vermont State University in Randolph. So again, watch for more information um, about that in, in upcoming emails. So that concludes the annual meeting, the business portion of our summit. Um, does anybody have any questions? Would any AVCC member or board member like to make a motion to adjourn? I have to do that according to uh, Robert's rules. I so will make anyone... a motion to adjourn. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor, either raise your hand or say aye. 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 Is anyone opposed to ending the, the annual meeting portion of our summit? Okay, great. So what I'll do is I'm going to stop screen sharing and now turn it over to Bill, who's going to talk to us about the 30 by 30 legislation. Yeah, thanks, Mark, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to see many familiar faces and some new ones. Um, I'm Bill, the treasurer of ABCC. And yeah, 30 by 30 legislation is really exciting. Um, so basically in, in the light of widespread habitat loss, declines in rare and common species, climate change that's scrambling ecologies everywhere and massive you know, community impacts like we saw from the flood this summer, um, the Vermont legislature passed Act 59 
aka the 30 by 30 bill, which aims to protect biodiversity, enhance community resilience um, and vitality, and further and start like the next chapter of our state's vibrant history as being a leader in land conservation for our human and natural communities. This act establishes state goals of conserving 30% of the land of the state by 2030 and 50% by 2050. And it requires the Vermont Housing Conservation Board in consultation with the Secretary of Natural Resources and ANR to develop an inventory of the existing conserved lands in the state and plan on how to reach those goals. Um, so right now, VHCB and the state are working together with a widespread and growing group of conservation partners to develop this inventory of existing conserved lands in Vermont and develop plans for funding this, uh, this program and more land conservation, which includes you know, and, and aims to optimize how federal, state, and private funds will be implemented. Um, and within this analysis, partners are in the process of working through how conserved natural, natural areas of all types, state forests, federal lands, co conservation easement lands, riparian and water resources, working forests and ag lands and of all types um, will play into factor, you know, factor into biodiversity, wildlife connectivity, and community needs. And so, you know, soon there will be an announcement for widespread um, public engagement um, with meetings and other ways for public comment and involvement in this process. And that will be announced broadly soon. And as much participation from towns and ABCC members um, will be really valuable. Local involvement in conservation is incredibly important, especially in Vermont. And I thank all of you for, for doing your part and being so dedicated to conservation, you know, where every town has a great influence to provide conservation outcomes especially when it comes to managing, stewarding, and creating new town lands and forests. And in regards to 30 by 30 towns, um, planning on conserving existing owned lands or um, creating new town forests and conserving them will play a huge role. Um, and for towns considering this process, I encourage them to reach out um, um, to the local community to talk about what might work for their town and then reaching out to, you know, we have a, a lot of great nonprofits, uh, state agencies, or VHCB for more information on how to get started and, and to like plan how to protect uh, you know some land that has community benefits and wildlife connectivity and all and flood resilience and all those great things that conserved lands provide. Um, and so I'm going to post a link to the act in the chat um, and also a link to an article about how Palinol has just completed a really great land conservation project conserving 300 acres that adjoins an existing town forest uh, along the Taconic Ridgeline, um, enhances wildlife connectivity across three states um, and has a lot of, um, and improves um, public access um, to those lands. Um, and, you know, I think off the top of my head, Pownall, Moncton, Hinesburg, um, just with VHCB have completed really great large scale conservation projects that um, advance uh, climate resilience, wildlife connectivity, and community needs. So um, anyone has any questions about um, the 30 by 30 bill? Um, I can take them after the meeting. I want to leave enough time for our towns to talk about the great work that they're doing. Um, and the state conference um, next year in, in June will have a really big focus, a broad focus on 30 by 30 and public involvement on how we can uh, reach those goals. So thank you so much. I think I'll pass it off to Marion. Great, thanks Bill for that overview of 30 by 30 and, and know it's really an exciting time in the state for conservation efforts and focus and hope we can, we'll continue to keep you all updated as local conservation commissions about the opportunities to engage and get involved in that work. And as Bill said, hope we'll have time at the end for some questions, but if you do have questions that come up um, as you listen to that overview or as you hear from other conservation commissions, please do put them in the chat and we'll, we'll work to get to them at the end of the presentation. But without further ado, we're gonna to move to this, uh, one of the most exciting parts of our meeting today is hearing from other conservation commissions around the state about the work that they've done using tiny grant funds to further conservation efforts in their communities. So I'm gonna just quickly walk through the seven conservation commissions we'll be hearing from today. Each will have five minutes to give a presentation and share some videos um, about work that they've done using tiny grants from ABCC. As Mark said, they'll be sharing challenges, lessons learned, successes from work that they've done in their communities, and hope it will really be a sounding board for you all in your communities to think about projects, similar projects, or ways you could do this work 
um, to, uh, to further conservation efforts in your communities and, and how to partner with communities across the state. So I'll outline the seven here and we'll just uh, logistically note that Caitlin has all of the presentations and the videos up and is going to work th walk through them for the presenters. Um, we ask folks um, to take no more than five minutes to do your presentations. I'll be doing timekeeping and can send you all send folks a personal uh, message in Zoom when you have about a minute left just to keep you aware of the time frame here. Um, we want to ensure we can get to everyone's presentation and have time for questions at the end. So with that, we're going to, I'll run through who we're going to hear from, and then we'll turn it over to Bolton, as you can see. Amy from Bolton is going to share uh, about a project to build a raised walkway to avoid degradation of trail in their town forest. We'll then hear from Matt in Hartford, who's going to talk about amphibian road crossing project that they worked on. Sabina and Jericho is going to speak to creating a pollinator garden. We'll hear from Lois and Johnson about an emerald ash borer awareness project. Deborah and Munkin, who's going to be speaking to invasive plant removal. Annette in Richford, who's going to be speaking about pollinator awareness campaigns. And then Louisa in Shrewsbury, who's going to be speaking about game cameras to monitor wildlife crossings. So with that, I'll hand it over to Amy, and we're looking forward to hearing about everyone's projects. Go ahead, Amy. And just let me know next or next slide when you want me to switch slides, please. OK, yeah, thanks very much. So thanks for the tiny grant. We appreciate getting that. That did help us complete our project. Our uh, Preston Pond Conservation Area had a place where the trail became very narrow, and there were really two wetlands, one on either side of it and uh, maybe about 30 feet of kind of dry, dry some dry and some dry-ish land, depending on uh, the season between them. There is a culvert that goes between the two wetlands. There was a beaver, super motivated beaver, plugged up that culvert and a local person who unplugged it and they the beaver would plug it and the person would unplug it and the beaver would plug it. Anyway, it was a, a battle of wills and the beaver was definitely winning. Um, so, it was just a part of the trail that was wet and, uh, you know, getting degraded, more and more degraded. The beaver clearly, you know, wanted more territory. So we started talking about it about six months before we actually did the project. And that's kind of a good timeline for us. We found it takes many months to discuss a plan, agree on a plan, have the select board approve the plan, look for volunteers, look for funding. Um, so that was a good timeline for us. Do you wanna to go to the next slide? So this shows the, on the right, the culvert plugged up at one point. On the left is the wetland that's uh, to the north of this area, really beautiful. Um, next slide. Yeah, this is, we built the, we decided to build the boardwalk in sections. So if we ever wanted to move it or we needed to raise it for any reason, we could disassemble and uh, raise it up. And it was just easier to build off location. So there it is in my driveway. <laughs> and um, there we are at the site kind of working on putting it in and uh, approaching finished in the picture on the right. We had a little snafu with, we had scheduled our major workday. We had a couple of little workdays and then our big workday to install it happened to be on a school vacation day, which we had not thought about. And one of our major volunteers and a person with a truck, they're like, oh, well, we're parents and that's school vacation week, we're away. But they didn't let us know till maybe three weeks before. And we had to scramble to kind of fill in the blanks a little bit, but it all worked out. We had a number of great volunteers. You could go to the next slide. And uh, there it is. This is, uh, I think, in April. And um, the closest wetland is on the left of the, the picture to your right. <laughs> and uh, then you can almost see that we had um, drained a little bit of the water to the right. The, the bigger uh, picture, the first picture I showed you was below, uh, that's to the north. So go to the next picture. Thanks. So this is a picture. These are very recent. And here we are this year. And the beaver, uh, as you can see in the picture on the right more clearly, has decided to use the boardwalk kind of as a little dam. It's making a little dam right up against it. It, it loves that. And it's made another dam maybe 100 feet upstream from there. And it's reinforced that. And there's a lot of beaver activity. So you can see on the right of the picture on the right, there are some uh, beaver little beaver tree uh, remnants there, little toothpicks sticking up and the beaver is very excited. They're very busy. 
And they've raised that up in the area on the right used to be uh, mostly dry, but now you can see it's turning into a wetland too. So we may need to raise this up. So we're glad that we left that possibility. Uh, next slide. This is the uh, area that's to the south right now and how it's looking at this moment. At the far edge of the horizon of the wetland is where the next dam would be seen if the picture was clearer. Um, we got funding from our town conservation reserve funds for this project, as well as from the tiny grant. And um, we had a dedicated leader who was very organized and made drawings. And uh, we were a good partnership of, you know, this person did this part and that person did that. And so we, we had a really a great team. Um, and we might need to raise that boardwalk up sometime soon. We're not sure <laughs> what, what will be next. So um, that is most of it. Is next slide, is there a next slide? I'm not sure that there is, that might be it. That's your last slide, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Great to hear about that project. And now we'll turn it over to Matt from Hartford. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, well, actually, I'm Tom Kale, but oh, close sorry enough. About that. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you for the uh, introduction and for the chance uh, for the talk a few minutes, five minutes about the 2021 AVC, AVCC tiny grant uh, that we received. So, so Hartford is where the White River comes into the Connecticut River, um, the town of Hartford. Uh, White River Junction shows on the map, but that's just one of five villages in the town of Hartford. So don't ever tell anybody from Queechee or Wilder that they live in the uh, town of White River. Um, the Hartford Conservation Commission's mi mission is basically three three components. The first one is, you know, protect the natural resources in the town, educate the community about our natural resources, and foster environmental stewardship. Um, in the April of 2020, uh, a grassroots organization started up in the town, not connected with the, the Conservation Commission, called the Hartford Salamander Team, and their purpose was to uh, help um, amphibians in the spring safely migrate across the roads. As, as most of you know, um, things like tree frogs and salamanders live most of their life in an upland habitat under leaf litter and the like. But in the spring, um, when you start to get warm nights in the evening, they're generally wet, uh, they have to migrate to uh, water in order to uh, breed. And that might include crossing a road. Um, they do this sort of in mass during those concentrated times, and there can be high mortality of amphibians uh, during these migrations at night. So in the winter of 2021, the, the Hartford Salamander team approached the Conservation Commission and asked for some funding. They wanted to uh, participate in the North Branch Nature Center's uh, amphibian road crossing project. So next slide. Uh, so the Hartford Salamander team has a pretty uh, pretty dynamic website. Um, because we received the grant, we were able to fund their participation in the North Branch Nature Center's training. Uh, they had the training in the spring of March 2021, and it was very successful. They had uh, over 60 participants, not only the town of Hartford, but the whole Upper Valley. Um, and way more than they had had the previous year. Um, since then, over the following uh, three seasons of the migration seasons, they've you know helped an estimated 800 frogs at 13 different sites. And one of the most important part is part of this um, of the uh, North Center's program is that they record the number of uh, crossings and, and amphibian encounters at these different sites. So, and it's stored on a website that's available. So we can see where are the hot spots in the town uh, that need to, you know, concentrate mitigation. And also uh, over since 2021, we've, uh, you know, the um, we collaborated with the Salamander team and other organizations for different educational events. Uh, we, it's increased the participation in our annual uh, salamander walk that we've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years. 
And then lately the Salamander team has expanded and gone into uh, having monthly meetings uh, where they talk, they gather people together and talk about different conservation subjects. Uh, next slide. So uh, the benefits. Um, so because of the grant, you know, the grant enabled us to uh, work with the salamander teams in advance all three of our major missions, you know, protection, education, and stewardship. You know, um, working with the salamander team, it's increased the public awareness, you know, about the importance of amphibian crossings during migration and just the general ecology of uh, vernal pools and that type of habitat. Um, education, um, besides, as I mentioned, besides just salamanders and amphibian crossings, uh, the salamander teams uh, developed uh, these talks on a monthly basis and talk about, you know, fungi and birds and, you know, use of iNaturalist and, and just different things. Probably the most important benefit um, is the participation. Um, you know, this was a, a team, a grassroots organization that came to us, and it was younger people, and mostly in their early to middle 20s. And uh, there was a little bit of skepticism among some of the Conservation Commission members, you know. Uh, you know, who, you know, we've been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years, this conservation thing, so who are these uh, folks? But um, it's really worked out well. I mean, and they've um, able to attract, uh, you know, some younger people that typically have been upper, underrepresented in uh, our other Conservation Commission events, and uh, that's been great. And then collaboration, as I mentioned before, the stewardship programs. And we are we're actually working with the Salamander team now in the process of setting up um, an educational program um, with different stewardship or naturalist programs so uh, that's it thank you thanks tom that was great and particularly like the hartford salamander team's logo really need to get that on a, a shirt or a hat <laughs> uh, they're in their little uh saying there go out in the night and have fun <laughs> that's that's great i i'm i'm not surprised they have a lot of young membership that's fantastic all right so now we're going to turn it over to sabina with jericho Hi, and again, I share um, thanks from the Conservation Commission for um, giving us this grant and allowing us to do some of our work. So um, part of our community outreach involves um, creating pollinator habitat in public spaces, which we hope then um, serves as a model for best practices so that people can then um, see what's possible in their in their home landscapes. Um, uh, next slide, I think, yeah. So um, we have an existing pollinator garden in a public space on our town green. Um, that was installed by volunteers in 2018 through a grant from the Native Plant Trust. They had a program called Pollinate New England, and we were one of two Vermont locations that got this garden installation. Um, so uh, we, in a couple of years ago, the town um, took down some red maples next to the town hall. And we decided that that might be an opportunity to again, expand um, some of our public gardens. And so we, um, we thought that would be a good opportunity. And so we went to the select board and pitched our idea to take this little patch of land that's basically between the driveway to town hall and the parking lot. So it's really like a little spit of land um, and see if we could turn that into some nice uh, pollinator habitat. So the trees were um, taken down by the tree warden and what was left after that was a very large clump of daylilies, uh, the orange kind. So um, those, in, in a lot of municipalities, those can be considered invasive and they don't really have a lot of pollinator benefit. Um, and so, you know, we, we decided to take those out. Plus we knew that with their, their, um, their ability to spread rapidly, we just figured that would um, always be in competition with our 
with our plantings. So we we did a couple of service days, took out the daylilies, and then um, we also planted four service berry trees. So we used um, Amelanchy or Lavis as our foundation plantings, and so those went in first. And then um, the fall, this this last spring in. 20, oh, it must have been 2023. Anyway, this year we planted plugs. So um, I I guess the one the one thing our select board had sort of put before us as a as a challenge was to keep it looking um, relatively tidy. So if you know anything about wildlife gardening, you know that sort of uh, antithetical to wildlife gardening, but um, I took that challenge on and um, tried to choose plants that I knew were sort of better behaved, as as they like to say. So um, we put in um, um, helenium, which is known as sneezeweed, um, pycnanthemum, which is mountain mint, um, put in some uh, echinacea, some rudbeckia, um, penstemon digitalis, which you may or may not be familiar with. That is um, um, foxglove beard tongue. Um, some spring blooming pollinator plants. We have Apollegia canadensis, which is um, the native columbine, and Zizia aurea, which is um, golden alexanders, which is a host plant for black swallowtail butterflies. And then lastly, um, uh, Aster umbla, ob, oblongifolia, which um, blooms now and is also a great um, fall pollinator plant. So try to spread it out among the seasons and try to pick things that um, didn't get to be super huge with a tendency to flop and look disheveled. Um, we got our plants all from local, relatively local nurseries. So Orwell, Essex, and Fairfax. Um, next slide. And again, we're trying to put these gardens in places where people will see them. So this is the, the view um, when you're coming on the sidewalk and getting to the town hall, there's a bench, there's, you know, it's visible to, to people walking by. And so um, we thought that was another plus for that location. Um, you can see, uh, uh, astute viewers will see that there's milkweed in there and also some volunteer um, Virginia creeper. Um, but um, for the most part, you know, it's those plantings that I mentioned. And because I use plugs, um, that's a little bit less expensive. And so you're starting out with a much smaller plant. So um, this was not like an instant garden. It's going to take a couple of years to really fill itself in. And that's OK, too. But um, that's just sort of how I chose to do it to stretch our grant dollars. Um, let's see. So yeah, next slide. So the second part of our, our grant project and um, pollinator habitat is this other area on our green. So another thing that we are charged with is sort of the general health care of the trees on our public green. And one thing we have noticed over the past few years is that around the trees, because of the lawn care service and people using the space and walking all around the trees, the area around the drip line was, was severely impacted. I mean, you can see how sad those roots on that sugar maple look. Um, and so we decided to try to create like a win-win-win situation out of this. And so we um, are underplanting the drip lines of some of these trees with things like um, oak sedge, which is Carex pennsylvanica, and some ferns and other woodland perennials. And that serves multiple purposes. So um, it will, um, provide habitat for moths and butterflies that are, you know, using the trees during their life cycle. And so it will um, give them a place to, to hide in the winter. It will prevent further compaction of the soil and root damage. And it also gives just this, we put these little fences around so that the grant money was used to, to get these little fences as well. Um, it comes in big rolls. So that also kind of gives a visual cue to the landscape company um, 
because they were uh, very often going right up to the trees with their equipment and causing a lot of damage to the bark. So um, next slide. Um, so this is what it looked like a few weeks ago. We, we also have some educational signage up and um, we have a, a QR code that takes us to the website. Next sign, next slide. I think that's the last one. And then again, we're, we're modeling this on this soft landings concept, which is promoted by Doug Tallamy and um, Heather Holm. So that's visible through that QR code. And I, I just looked at our metrics behind the scene. It looks like from the time I put the QR code up to today, we got about 30 visitors. So um, that seems pretty good. I think that's all I have. Is that right? Yeah, that's your last slide. Okay. Thank so thank you. Thanks, Sabina. Some fantastic projects there. Thanks for coming and sharing with us. All right. Next, we'll turn it over to Lois uh, with Johnson. Go ahead, Lois. And Lois, I have your videos up. So just let me know if you'd like to speak first or we just go through the videos first. Lois, are you able to unmute yourself? We can't hear you. You are trying. I just went through meeting participants and I'm not seeing Lois on. Okay. Is there anyone so, from Johnson? Yeah, is there anyone from Johnson you'd like to share? They do have some awesome videos, so we can just go ahead and play them even if they're they're not available. Um, well, why don't we go ahead and and perhaps move to Moncton and we can good. Yeah. circle back to Johnson if Lois is able to join. Sorry, <laughs> there we go. Hi, um, I'm from Moncton, obviously. Um, our can, um, project, thank you also for the tiny grant for this project um, from last year. Uh, we did an invasive, invasive removal project we uh, in June 2022, we purchased two uprooter tools to be used mm -hmm. for mitigation of buckthorn and other invasive trees and shrubs, particularly um, honeysuckle. But we focused on buckthorn, and this this is two members of our conservation commission enjoying <laughs> digging up buckthorn. Um, next slide. In June of last year, we did have a workshop after we got the uprooters at our central school. And that, that wood you saw on the last slide was at the Moncton Central School behind. There's some property that, that is, has quite a bit of buckthorn in it. And we had a, um, a talk with or Travis Hart from VT Fish and Wildlife came and presented and talked about different invasive, the, the major invasive species, um, plant species that we, we were dealing with. We had 21 attendees, um, including the Conservation Commission members and the Moncton community members, and a few people came from other towns as well. Um, next slide. After the presentation, we did have a brief work session to, to so people could try out the uprooters. And we did tell our community members that, it that the tools were available to be checked out if they want to use them on their own property. We actually have we bought those two and then we ended up purchasing another one um, later in the year with our own funds. And then three of us, I think, each have our own as well. So all together, we probably have seven of them and we're happy to loan those out to anybody who would like to use them and go after buckthorn or honeysuckle. Um, next slide. So we had two, two more work sessions in August and October. Again, this is the Moncton Central School of Woods. You can see a few more people. Um, Eight people came to this particular session, and then at the next one, there were five. Uh, next slide. And our intent is to have this be ongoing, to have several sessions per year to continue. We do continue to work, and we're getting quite a pile of buckthorn. Um, unfortunately, one of the things you have to deal with is weather, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, as all of you know. So we, we did have another session in June this year, and we had one scheduled earlier this month, but that was the weekend that the tropical storm Philippe came through and a huge downfall, and it's not fun out there in the mud um, trying to dig buckthorn, so we canceled that session. But we'll continue to try to have um, two or three per year, but they do unfortunately compete with our wild parsnip <laughs> sessions, which are held in the summer, so we have to try to do both. Next slide. 
And so success is here's here's the pile of buckthorn um, that we keep adding to. At this point, of course, it's all the leaves are gone, and um, it should be it, it makes a nice brush pile for a wildlife too. So it, that can be helpful. Um, we do have, as you can see, a decent number of the shrubs that have been and trees that have been removed. Some of them are actually so large that a couple of our conservation commission members ended up using chainsaws, but they are both trained in chainsaw use, so it was safe. Um, and I did want to mention also one of the presentation um, attendees from Cornwall at our, the, the presentation last summer then um, had Travis come to Cornwall and they did a presentation there and I think they had maybe close to 30 members she said then also he came and looked at her individual property and gave her advice about invasives and there was another attendee at that who was there from Weybridge and did the same thing so Travis is pretty wonderful about going out and I think there may be other people in Vermont um, fish and wildlife that may do the same thing and give advice on invasives on people's private property. Uh, next slide. And challenges, um, the, it's difficult. I was, it was wonderful to see with the amphibians that you had a large group of young people. Um, we seem to have a core group, which is kind of our conservation commission, five of us. So we're, we typically get five or six people at every session and, and that's about it. We do definitely advertise on Front Porch Forum and, and the um, Addison County or the Addison Independent, but um, it's, it's hard to get people to, to show up, particularly I think because this is all an ongoing project and we're, so we're asking every year and we are competing. It's the same people doing the wild parsnip. And after a while, there's a bit of burnout involved, I think. I, in fact, my next door neighbor said, oh, when I told or asked her about coming, she said, oh, we did that about, I think it was, it was before I was actually here, so five five years ago, um, but it's kind of a people cycle in and out, apparently, and th those of us who are diehards will probably die still <laughs> digging bucks for it, but that's, that's the way it is. Anyway, um, it's, it's, it's still fun. I enjoy doing it. I like going after the invasives. There's a really, a real feeling of satisfaction, so um, again, thank you for the opp opportunity to, pre to present our information to you and our, our slides and also for the grant. And we'll just keep going after that buckthorn. Thank you. Well, thanks, Deborah, for sharing and appreciate that buckthorn is everywhere. So appreciate all the work to, to get it out. I wanted to check and see if Lois is here and able to share from Johnson. You might be on mute, Lois, trying to speak. I think Lois might be trying to speak, but is on mute. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm okay now? I think we can hear you, yes. So let's go okay. ahead and okay. Lois' presentation. Great, thank you. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll use the um, the two videos in a little bit. I wanted to, um, first of all, thank you all for the, the uh, tiny grants over the years. They've really made a difference. Um, my overview starts with a long history of EAB awareness for our Conservation Commission. We had one of our members, Susan Lovering, who incidentally designed that outfit you just saw on the screen and sewed it, um, took an invasive, an invasive um, she became an invasive pest person and has kept us all these years looking at various invasives, including the emerald ash borer. So in 2015, she had us primed for requesting a grant to make some educational materials around EAB awareness. We had four videos we were able to make. We were able to do uh, full page advertisements in the local papers. Um, Sue went on to create a regional invasive committee to be prepared when the EAB got here. Now, all that groundwork seems like it was just kind of boring stuff, but the videos were able to create a lot of attention around the fact that EAB was out there. And then in 2018, EAB arrived in Vermont. And we were, we were ready, we'd been doing work. Uh, fortunately, it was in the southern part of the state, not up north, 
but uh, it gave us a, a chance to start thinking about more programming. And that was when we requested the 2021 tiny grant. And the re our request was to update the videos that had been been out and around and seen lots of, of use just as awareness. Uh, we got the grant and we made the videos and let's show the first one, which is the uh, wanted. Great, great. Um, hopefully the sound comes through. Lois, you might need to mute just so that we don't get any feedback, but hopefully this okay. Wanted, actually not wanted. The emerald ash borer, alias EAB. This invasive insect has been decimating ash trees throughout the eastern United States. Now that EAB is in Vermont, we are working to slow the spread. You can help. By reporting suspected infestations, by not transporting firewood, and by protecting your high-value ash trees with targeted treatments. For more information about slowing the spread of EAB, visit vtinvasives.org. All right. Would you like me to play the next one? Uh, not, not yet. Okay. Might still talk a little bit first, then okay. we'll do that one. Um, let's see. You wanted to know more about how it all went. Well, when you come to doing EAB, people have different interests. But we certainly were able to find folks that were interested in participating in our filmmaking projects. So when 2021 came along, we were able to get the folks who helped with the first one to come back and, and help in the, in the updating. That was really very helpful. Um, what we had to do was for the grant, we had to, to, to rewrite the scripts, but it was pretty straightforward, but we still had to, to, to do that. And the good news was we, because we kept up with Vermont Invasives, which is a wonderful resource, we were able to have all the updated information available. Our good fortune was having the same videographer who worked with us on the first grants uh, be available to do the update. And he's been a, just a wonderful volunteer. Um, and I say volunteer, we, we paid him some money, but he put in twice as much time as we paid for um, easily. And after we finished making the upgrades of the four videos, Chris, our videographer said, why don't we do one more? And so we decided that since he wanted to do it, and at this point there was a treatment available, an option for people to consider we said, let's go for it. So here's the next video. Finally made it to Vermont. The emerald ash borer is now spreading in Vermont. I don't. The outlook for ash trees in the state is grim. I've been infecting and killing ash trees all over the country. And now I'm coming for yours. <laughs> what can you do to protect your special ash trees? Please. There is no cure for EAB infestation, but it is possible to protect individual trees from infection with special treatments. I'm sorry. Find out more at utnasics.org. So our, our videos seem like just plain fun, but the fact is there's a lot of education in, in, the, in a couple of them. Two of them are three minutes long. And so we were able to, to cover a lot of what people needed to know about um, EAB and how to identify and next steps and those kinds of things. Um, since we only had five minutes, I couldn't show you one of those. Uh, they are all available. All you have to do is go to YouTube, EAB, Johnson, Vermont, and they'll all come up. And, and they're fun <laughs> and helpful. What we gauged from it was uh, lots of invitations to participate locally in um, parades and other activities 
we took our EAB to the flower show. Um, the outfit the, and the <laughs> actual Emerald Ash Bora is played by Susan Mulvern, our star. And uh, she's always willing to get out and, and talk about not only EAB, but it gives us a chance to, to meet with other folks who are like-minded. Uh, we always have a sign-up sheet for help in the future and it makes a big difference. It's a little piece, but it's a, it's a big difference. So we wanna thank you ever so much for, for helping us keep our lesbian activities going. Thanks. Thanks, Lois. Appreciate that. And I see some questions about is the costume pattern available? So maybe we can get to that at the end here. So just want to note, we have about five minutes left until the end of our scheduled meeting. We have two presentations to go. So if folks can stick around a little bit, that'd be great. Um, I'll continue to, to kind of time keep as we go through. But next, we'll hear from Richford Conservation Commission with Annette. Go ahead, Annette. Hi there, everybody. Oh, I'm totally inspired by all these projects. Um, so we had a tiny grant, so we're very grateful to have received $550 um, to help us create better habitat for pollinators at our Richford Elementary School. So if you want to show the next slide, I think I've got an, um, just uh, one of the children there. Um, as you can see in the background, we do have woods. Um, there's a big soccer field there, but if you go to the next slide, you can kind of see that we are surrounded by woods on a couple sides of the school and it is wonderful habitat. Um, I feel very grateful that there's a brook on one side and there are woods and, and kids can really explore um, great habitats on two sides of the school. But of course, every school needs a soccer field and a baseball field and all that softball. But um, there's a big, big swath of just plain green um, <laughs> that really serves no other purpose but to kind of be green, maybe look pretty, but <laughs> it really um, deters from habitat for pollinators and wildlife in general. Um, so we wanted to create awareness about that. Uh, with our public and what better way to start than with our children. Um, so we decided uh, back a year ago this time um, to try to fix that there. And we happened to have um, the opportunity for a grant from the Upper Missisquoi and Trout River Committee. Um, so uh, you matter, those are federally designated wild and scenic rivers. So um, they have grants available and every year it's a different theme. So we did garner a grant from them to support habitat for bats and pollinators. So we had some things going, but we needed a little more funding to create our vision of what we could do at Richard Elementary School. So that's where the tiny grant came in. Um, so we, you can see where the school is, and we created a pollinator garden in back of the school um, where there, it was next to what was already a community, well, community, a school for the garden, the kids and a garden for the kids in the school, which kind of gets planted in the spring. Some years, there are people that work on it over the summer, and sometimes weeds come in, but there is an effort back of the school. So we created a seven foot swath by 20 foot um, plot in back of the school. Um, and we, so we rototilled it twice in the spring to get it ready. And maybe go to the next slide. Um, so uh, what we did was we, we basically had adults that helped with um, different parts of the project. We reached out to mostly the after school program there. So we had a couple of times with the after school program, um, quite a few children um, help, helped pollinate, help spread seeds in the garden and also um, painted little mason bee um, houses, nest houses that they could put up there and also take home. And it resulted in lots of flowers and happy pollinators. So if you go to the next slide, we'll see some of what took place. So um, there you've got the kids trampling down the seeds that they have thrown into the garden. They created little seed bombs 
earlier in another session that they then um, sprinkled in the garden. And then um, that's our Richford Conservation Commission member, Dan Seeley, um, on the left of the, the slide on the left, or the picture on the left. And he's talking to the kids. And then in the next slide, you can see him um, going over the plot with snowshoes, which the kids thought was pretty hilarious, but <laughs> we did too. But that tamped it all down. And then if you go to the next slide, um, this is a slide of the mason bee um, nest houses that um, we had another session to tell them about the importance of our native wild bees. Um, honeybees, we you know, shared that are not native to Vermont, even though they are important for our fruits and pollination, but we have a lot of wild bees that need our help as well. And that's why we were planting the pollinator garden. And so uh, Dan had made all these uh, nest houses, the You Matter grant paid for the lumber for that, but the kids all um, painted these and brought them home. So next slide. And so this was, um, Part of our effort was to, to spread awareness. We created these signs and encouraged the public on Front Porch Forum and in the newspapers and um, just to get people to not mow their lawns in the month of May. And so we offered these signs to children at the school to take home. We offered them through the public library, um, tried to get the word out. Um, so I don't know if you remember, but May was a pretty warm, uh, sorry, yeah, May was pretty warm, and then we got all the rain in the summer. Um, but so we had some success with that. I think um, people had to maybe mow their lawns by Memorial Day. It was getting pretty, <laughs> pretty rough if they had to, but we definitely heard back from people that they tried to curtail um, the parts of their garden that they mowed. So it's sort of spread awareness of what you can do in your own uh, property. Next slide. So this, the ABCC Tiny Grant let us build on this awareness and we made up, we bought wildflower seed native to the Northeast and we uh, packaged it up. We had a conservation commission member meeting and we just um, kept these little, um, little labels and then we bought little packets and packaged up the seed to give away. And we give the, gave those to the school children. We offered them at the public library and at the town hall for free. So we distributed a lot of seed packets for the public. So hopefully there were more wildflower gardens all over our, our township. Next slide. So this is the pollinator garden in the summer. Um, this the pollinator seed mix was a variety of annuals and perennials. So we are going to watch and see what comes up next year, but it was full of a lot of cosmos and rudbeckia this year. So the pollinators were definitely there. The, the times that we have gone to check it, um, it's been loaded with um, native bees. So that's been great to see and butterflies as well. Next slide. Um, just more views of the garden so you can kind of see um, the school in the background there. Next slide. And just some close-ups of the, the um, wildflowers that came up and a native bee right there. Um, next slide. And then we also collected milkweed this time last year, milkweed seeds. Um, knowing that we wanted to do this project. So the school children also um, spread milkweed seeds in an area that, that was um, already had a little bit of milkweed in there, but we roughed up the soil near it and um, in a spot where it's not gonna bother anybody and just create more habitat for pollinators. So the kids could see in the fall when they came back to school that there were definitely some uh, success with um, for monarch butterflies there. Next slide. Um, so we check things throughout the summer. Some of the plants, uh, we also bought bushes. So sorry, I'm focusing on the pollinator garden, but we also bought uh, bushes for pollinators. So we bought um, 30 bushes from the Franklin County Conservation District in the spring. And so we wanted to support another conservation organization with that project. And the ABCC grant helped us do that. So uh, we bought 10 winterberry bushes, 10 elderberry bushes, and 10 American cranberry bushes that would 
have um, lots of blossoms for pollinators, but be also good for songbirds and other wildlife um, with their berries later. Uh, so we planted all those in the spring. They were bare root and you can see some of them with the little flags there. They were very small. So one of the lessons that we learned was <laughs> it's maybe better to, to buy bigger bushes because we did lose some of those over the wet summer. I think we, we weren't that concerned. It was wet. They we, we were a little when we planted them, we came back and watered them, but then it got up to be a very rainy summer. So, but when we checked on them, we realized some of them probably drowned or the weeds got around them. We should have mulched them a little bit better. Um, so we just purchased some more bushes a few weekends ago, and we worked with a local nursery who gave us a discount, and he, uh, we got, uh, with the winter berries, you never know what you're getting to, you need a male, so we, we have one nice full-size male now, and then we bought three other females, so that's us, um, next slide too, just planting those this fall, or early September, and we mulched those. We got a free load of mulch, which was great from a local wood chip plant that is literally right in back of the railroad tracks behind the school. So um, they, they gave us, they brought over a load of mulch, which was wonderful. So next slide. Yeah, so just more views of those winterberry bushes, which we put along the edge of the garden uh, or the field there in back of the school. And then we also bought a couple plants for a memorial garden that was out front of the school. Again, you can see that that's a really wide swath of mowed lawn, but there was an existing garden there for in memory of a guidance counselor who passed away about 30 years ago, and it had a dead crab apple. So we removed the dead crab apple and we put instead a Wygelia um, in the foreground there in front of the birdhouse and a dwarf Korean uh, tree lilac, which I have a Korean uh, lilac at my house and it is loaded with uh, uh, tiger swallowtail butterflies in the spring. It smells beautiful. Um, so that will be great in the sp for spring pollination. Next slide. That's all funding from AVCC that paid for that. And then so next year, we're hoping to have some more programs with the children. And I'm totally inspired by Jericho's like soft landing project. And maybe we can do some of that around the trees, um, but also your QR code. Um, we wanna get some signage out and do some more programs with kids um, so that we keep the awareness alive with them. Um, so we, if we also could create some signage around the garden would be great. And next year we plan to also see what comes up for perennials and donate some from our own uh, gardens. Um, definitely native type perennials, asters, that kind of thing. And following Jericho's, um, I loved your slide of all the different ones that you picked. And um, we definitely wanna have a variety of native plants for all the different seasons that will bloom in the different parts of the season. So uh, next slide. Okay, so we, there used to be a, a couple of crab apples actually in front of the school and they were great for not only pollinators in the spring when they blossom, but also uh, songbirds uh, in, the, uh, in the fall and winter as well and early spring when the migrants come back. So there is one um, crab apple on the, uh, campus right now. And that one has berries that hold over the winter and are great for early migrants. Um, we plan to uh, get, if you show the next slide, where we've talked to our local nursery and he um, is ordering for us. Um, if you go to the next slide. That's the last oh, slide I have. Oh, oh that's, that's oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I added some, gosh, it's a Google Doc. So, so we do to wrap up soon in that if you don't okay. mind. Yeah so, we're, we're just, um, yeah, so we're getting a sugar thyme crab apple, which will be good for um, not only the, the blossoms, but the berries as well. So what we learned was with crab apples, you really need to worry about the variety that you get, not just that it looks pretty, but um, some varieties are not great for pollinators and the berries are inedible um, because um, they're just bred that way to not be attractive for birds and or to not drop on the ground so 
um, yeah, so thank you again. It um, will be a project that now we have infrastructure that um, will have long lasting benefits because we're gonna do more with that garden. So thank you so much. Thanks, Annette, I appreciate that. And last but not least, we're gonna turn it over to Louisa from Shrewsbury. And again, want to acknowledge we are over time, but appreciate everyone who's sticking around to, to hear all of this fantastic work. So go ahead, Louisa. And Louisa, I had a PDF from you all. So I'm just gonna exit out of my slideshow here and just let me know um, the best way to- sure. Just say slide. Scroll through, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me zoom out. <clears throat> So maybe. Okay. First of all, I'm Louise Duda and this is Linda Shelby and we're doing it together. <laughs> okay, great. Right. All right. In uh, 2021, we received a $600 tiny grant from the ABCC. <clears throat> this grant provided seed money for game cameras for a project by the Shrewsbury Conservation Commission to identify wildlife road crossings in our town and educate townspeople about the number and variety of animals whose travel corridors intersect our roadways. This will be with an eye towards convincing landowners and town management to conserve and protect these areas and understand the importance of conserving forested land on each side of the roadway. Next. No, it's actually the next one. Go ahead. Okay. Keep going. There are basically five steps we outline to manage this project. First, before even applying for the grant, we identified areas in town that were probably wildlife <clears throat> road crossings using GIS and BioFinder. We selected 16 uh, segments of road to monitor. Slide. Next, please. And I'm not sure if this came through all the way, but I can zoom in a little to what we have here. Yeah, well, Great. I think you get the <laughs> idea. <laughs> idea. Uh, Jens Hilke helped us make some of these determinations. So we can go to the next, please. Then our second step was to clarify the methodology we would use to collect data on winter tracks, sightings, carcasses, game camera photos and videos, and bear signs on utility poles. The game cameras were one of our first methods used to gather data on Route 103. Slide. Here are volunteers searching for culverts and the best placement of game cameras. Linda Shelby, our project leader, has extensive experience in using game cameras and trained others how to use and best place them. Slide. Here's a junior SCC member working with Linda on checking the videos captured. Back to the outline, please. Our third step was to engage residents in the citizen science collection of data to train volunteers and maintain interest with monthly articles and wildlife photos submitted by residents. To begin, Linda created a fabulous PowerPoint training session with hands-on activities to interest volunteers and begin the training. Click, slide. Um, COVID popped out right as we started this project. So many trainings were switched and done out on the roads. Here are volunteers in training learning to identify wildlife tracks and use the data collection sheets accurately in vests that we provided. In order to inform people and keep interest high, we publish frequent winter updates in our monthly Times of Shrewsbury, slide. Linda also started a monthly wildlife photo corner, which became very popular and created a lot of interest in game camera use and on a project. Slide. At this point, we have collected quite a lot of data in our first full winter of identifying and recording tracks. In spite of either, in spite of either too much snow let me, there's scarcity of snow, sorry about that. Slide. Here is a summary of 329 total tracks recorded this first full year, including 15 different species, including otter, bobcat, ermine, moose, fisher, and so on. This data was then transposed on a map. Slide. This map shows the density of tracks identified in various areas 
as indicated by light to darker blue. The bear sightings that we just started recording are, are circled. It is difficult to find tracks in winter on Route 103. Next. But the Velcro right of way transmission lines parallel Route 103. So we are currently adding bear signs to data, helping us to establish where many summertime animals cross the highway. Why? <clears throat> we have not begun the last two stages of our wildlife road crossing project as we're still collecting the data, but we're confident that collecting this diversity of data will clarify important road crossings and that this information can be used to help conserve important habitat on each side of the roads influence bridge and culvert replacements and provide data for our planning commission and developmental review board to use in determining building development in the future. And it all started with um, an AVCC tiny grant and two game stick cameras. We'll end with one of our first videos of an ermine slipping and sliding and having great fun in culvert runoff. I don't know if it's, oh, there it goes. <laughs> well, we are doing it. Play it one more time. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you can see him <laughs> or her. And no ermines were harmed in the filming of the video. <laughs> That's well, it. Thanks. Thanks, Linda and Louise. That was fantastic and so fun to see that video at the end. So thanks everyone so much for your presentations. We, we filled a lot in a little more than an hour, but didn't want to turn anyone away that we'd reach out to and think it's really amazing to hear um, what folks are doing with the tiny grant work, how you're sort of formulating and, and executing ideas, some challenges and, and things for folks to think about if you want to do similar work in your communities. Um, I will just flag it and the AVCC listserv is a fantastic resource for folks to ask questions, share ideas, ask about challenges or roadblocks or ways to overcome issues in your communities and maybe some ideas from the presentations today or, or things you could, you know, share on the AVCC listserv. Um, we are over, but do want to, if, if there are pressing questions from folks, would love to see that in the chat. Um, we could maybe get to one or two or, um, you know, happy to provide the presentations. This meeting is recorded and we'll post it online for folks to share and review later um, and hope that this sort of uh, helps build ideas and, and collaboration amongst conservation commissions. There was a, a question earlier in the chat, Bill, I wonder if you wanted to respond to about the 30 by 30 presentation and, and someone was asking about the role of Vermont conservation design in this work. Um, I'm yeah. curious if you had any thoughts on that. And then if folks have pressing questions, we can get to one or two in the chat, and then if not, we'll wrap up and, and hope we can continue the conversation through other avenues. Yeah, thanks, Mary. And so Vermont Conservation Design, like many of the state guiding plans, um, like the State Wildlife Action Plan um, and other plans from TNC or the Staying Connected Initiative are all being used to guide the principles of like conservation science that are going into the 30 by 30. Um, and it is, I can see how it might be a little confusing how, um, you know, we do have these conservation plans and designs already, um, you know, functioning and, and already in place. But the 30 by 30 plan is like, how do we coalesce all of this information um, into a way that provides action on the ground and, and funding for um, land conservation priorities? So, um, with that, I also want to mention that I forgot to uh, talk about earlier is the ABCC handbook, and I put a link to it in the chat, um, but that's a great way um, to look into how towns can start um, exploring uh, land conservation projects. Um, if towns don't have conservation commissions, how to start building one, um, basically the, the basic nuts and bolts of conservation commission work. Um, and it, everything that goes along with that like setting priorities and achieving goals, um, communication and engagement. So, so yeah, I hope that answers your question and, and uh, hope folks uh, check out the handbook. And also, um, like Marion said, the listserv is a great way uh, for folks to collaborate and communicate. Thanks, Bill. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat other than a big thanks to our presenters and everyone for joining today. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mark to wrap up. 
Well, I know we've gone uh, over the our hour, but I think it was well worth it. I know it was well worth it for me. I will just say again, thank you all for attending today. Thank you to the conservation commissions that presented. Um, when we sit down and review all the tiny grant uh, project submissions, it's very hard to select the ones that we can fund. We don't have a lot of money, so we can only fund certain ones. It was quite inspirational today to see these come to life. It's one thing to read them, but it's another to hear from you and see slides and pictures. So it really was great. And as I said, it was very inspirational. Hope it was inspirational for other folks. Um, watch for our announcements for the next round of Tiny Grants and send us your great ideas. So thank you everybody for attending and uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day and please keep up the great work. Thanks everybody, take care.